Church even as we take this time to prepare our hearts for worship, let's uh, meditate on the verse that's shown on the screen here. You have said, seek my face, and my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Psalms chapter 127, verse 8. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, let us rise as we do the call to worship. There is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. Together. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Amen.
joys and celebrations, Lord. Even as we take this time to be in the Lord's presence this morning, let's reflect on how the Lord has been so good and faithful towards us and how the Lord has been with us through our challenges, our hurdles and even when He was there with us in our achievements and our successes but at the end of the day we know that it's because of God Even as we sing the next song, let's remember on how the Lord has been so good towards us and how He has always been us, been with us, and how He will never ever fail us. And that nothing can come against us or stand between this unique and wonderful relationship that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, and grace and mercy. 
Father, thank you for calling us deeper and deeper into love with you. Father, thank you for that we can go deep. That Father, we don't have to stay at the surface. Father, we can just dive deep and go and just go deep. Because Father, when we go deep, Lord, Father, there is refuge. We are under the shadow of your wings. But Father, in it, Lord, we find our identity. And Lord, Father, even as we sing all these songs about going deep with you, over about how good a Father you are, Lord, we know that there are conflicts in the world. And Father, we know that foremost on everybody's mind is this thing about the Israel-Hamas conflict. And Lord, we pray for the humanitarian need. Father, we pray that there can be pauses. Uh, Father, we know that it's about the day after the day after. And Lord, but God, you are sovereign. And Lord, we uphold the situation to you, that Lord, that there will be peace uh, in the region. But Lord, we don't know what it will look like because Father, we know your ways are higher than ours. And Father, we don't know how exactly to pray into this. But Lord, we know you're sovereign. And Lord, we pray that you have mercy. And Father, in the midst of this, Father, we also pray that we will not be a church that gets distracted by whatever's in the headline. Father, because sometimes when it's in the headline, first of all, there was Turkey and then all that. And then we will all be praying about it. And then when the Israel conflict comes, then we will pray about it. But Father, they are, well, just because they are out of, Mm, out of the headlines does not mean that they are gone. And so, Father, we want to remember what has happened in this last year, the last few months. Father, we were praying for Turkey, Father, for the earthquake. And even though now the earth, the world has moved on, but Lord, let us be the church that keep praying. Father, let us not forget. Uh, let us not forget people who are still picking up the pieces. So, Father, right now as a church, as this very, very little church in this far side of Jurong, in this little place in Singapore. Father, we want to be the church that remembers and the church that intercedes. So, Father, we pray for you. We want to pray, Lord, uh, to you, Lord, to uh, continue to have mercy and help the effort that's ongoing in Turkey. Father, for the people who are trying to rebuild buildings to rebuild their lives. Father, we remember Morocco. Father, we remember South Sudan. Father, we remember all these places. Remember Libya with the flood. Father, we remember Bangladesh. Father, with whatever is happening that is at the refugee camps. Lord, you know that because of the crisis in the world, the amount of aid going to all these people who are further, further back in history is getting lesser and lesser. And yet, Lord, Father, they are very much alive and they are very much struggling. Father, we ask of you, Lord, help us to remember. Remember, Lord, because, Father, you're defender of the weak. You're defender of those who are voiceless. That, Father, even when the world moves on, Lord, help us not to move on. Help us to tarry and stay. Lord, so bring to us right now, Lord, even, um, yeah, even things that we said to people even a few months ago that we will pray for them. Father, let us be people who pray and stay faithful to prayer. Father, let us not be those who always uh, go after the next, uh, the next headline and pray for whatever is you know, in season. But Father, whatever is not, Lord, let us do. And Father, I know also in the midst of this, we were praying for all this, uh, Father, it will seem as if whatever we are facing our own lives are just like first world problems. And yet, Father, when we think of that, then Lord, we can feel so guilty that, you know, there are people who are starving, people in blackout, people, yeah, people who are just, you know, dying, and, and yet we are bothered about our own emotions, we are bothered about everything. But God, that is just how we are. Father, we are here, we are not there, we are, we are just here. And Father, we, whatever we carry, Lord, that is heavy to us. So Father, have mercy on us. Help us to carry all this weight, all this uncertainty that we are having. Because Father, you relate to each one of us. Because Lord, your eyes, Lord, you roam to and fro the earth. And so Father, we are here, Lord. Let your eyes roam on us as well. Father, even though, yes, it may not be, you know, uh, world newsworthy and all that, but Father, our our crosses that we carry, Father, is heavy. And yet, Lord, we want to remember that you said to come to you because us who are weary and you give us rest. So, Father, look upon us even as we want to pray for everyone else. Father, help us to be strong. Strengthen our frame. And Father, for those of us who are sick, Lord, Father, it gets even harder to pray for others when we are sick because, Father, it's just so real in the body. Father, the ache, the pain, the tiredness, Father, the fatigue. Yeah, the fatigue can be just so real. And Father, it's not like we don't want to, but Father, the flesh is, is so weak when the spirit can be willing. 
So Father, in the times when we don't know and we pray and pray and then we fall asleep, Father, help us to continue praying to you in the Spirit even when we are asleep. But we don't know how it will look like, but Lord, I pray you look at our hearts, look at what it is that we want to, we want to do. Help us, Father, with all the little desire that we have, all the, all the little resolution that we say to you, that God, uh, I want to do this for you, that God, I want, to, I want to be that, I want to do this. And yet at the end of the day, when we fail, Father, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, and always keep remembering, do not forget, Lord, that, uh, that we are made from dust. Father, do not forget, Lord, that we, that we are just what we are. And yet, Father, despite this, Lord, you love us, you reach down. Father, you, you put your righteousness in us. And so, Father, we thank you because no matter what we have done, Father, it is, we are always good enough for you. Good enough and more than good enough, Lord, because, because you see Christ. And until Christ is formed in us, Lord, Father, let us, let us pursue, let us run the race. Father, let us uh, run the race that's been marked up for us. Father, our race is not the one in Israel, it's not the one in Palestine, but Father, we have our race. And Father, help us be faithful in this race. Let us throw off all the sins that, yeah, that hinders, Father. Let us be aware, Father, we're standing before a great cloud of witnesses. Everything else that entangles, Father, let us put them aside and run with perseverance. Lord, this race mark up for us. Father, we all have our own battle, we all have our own race, but step by step, Lord, help us. And Father, uh, we want to especially take this time to remember Pastor Young. Father, the Miami's pastor that we are supporting. Lord, you know he is trapped now. Father, he's not able to go back to where he is because, because of the conflict that's in last year. Lord, we want to remember. We, we want to remember that. Father, we want to remember him. Lord, Father, I pray for a way out. I pray for his family. That, Father, that you protect them. Father, there's so many of your servants, people who are working in different areas. Father, we pray for your eyes, Lord, Father, to keep looking out for them. And Father, we pray that uh, whatever decision they have, that Lord, you guide the decision. That whether it's to the left, to the right, Lord, they will hear a voice saying, this is the way we walk in it. And that Father, they will walk in it with such discernment. Father, we pray for wisdom. Father, we pray for spirit of wisdom, power, knowledge, counsel. For, for the power of the Lord, Lord, to just be upon them. Because Father, the spirit of the Lord come upon them, Lord. So that Father, they can be mighty in the Lord. And Father, at times when they're discouraged, let them strengthen themselves in you as they did. Father, we uphold them. Father, we uphold people who are struggling. Pray for Agape. Father, we also want to pray for Singapore as well, Lord. Now we have all this thing about going forward that the government has just revealed. And it sounds very exciting because, wow, there's going to be so many things from education to skills future, especially those of us who are getting old. Father, there's all this thing like money coming in. And, uh, and Father, it's, it sounds like, a, like an interesting time because we, we are going into a new 4G chapter, all that. And yet, Father, we pray for execution on the ground. Father, policies can be good, but it's how we carry it out. So, Father, we pray for wisdom for people on the ground. That, Father, we'll be able to, uh, those people who can, Lord, that they'll be able to really be able to know how to put it into action. And, Father, we know we are in a bubble because, Father, we know that our success, Lord, uh, is your blessing, Father, how we are in the midst of where we are. Father, will you continue to, um, to give the leaders the wisdom how to navigate our country. And Father, in all this, for all the leaders in the world, from whether it's MBS or whether it's, uh, yeah, Biden, whether it's, uh, yeah, Netanyahu, Lord, we pray, Father, because we know that the King's heart is in your hand. Father, sway, sway, Lord, by the water course, because above all, you're King of kings, you're Lord of lords. And we thank you. And Father, we want to end this time by praying the Lord's Prayer, uh, which you have taught us, which is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, church, you may now sit. Okay, welcome everybody. If there's anybody who's new, uh, you can actually remain standing, but you're seated. Is there anybody who's new with us today? Oh, there's somebody. Okay, hi. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you say hi to you later. So everybody just wave at the people next to you, okay? Because you stood for a long time. Can you all just turn around and just say, just wave and say hi.
Yes, you can say peace be with you. You can say shalom. You can say anything. Okay. Announcement for today. We have uh, three announcements, two of which I will make. Can I have the announcements, please? Yeah, okay. Now, so this one is an exciting thing. Remember last year we had this, those of you who were there, uh, there was this micro workers outreach. And then for those of you who were not there, it kind of ended with, you know, a lot of people dancing, okay, at the end of it, spontaneously. Now, if you wonder what I'm talking about, why are people dancing at the end of it? Please come for this year. Chris, where are you? Is Chris around? Oh, Chris is there, yes. So he's the organiser. Now, so what we're having is this, okay? So we're going to have Christmas party at the Agape, 16th of December. It's going to be on a Saturday evening. Now, if you're free, please come and help us with it because in the party, we'll be running games booth. We'll be uh, doing different things. Once you sign up, more details will be given. But those of you who were there last year, I think we really had a good time. Uh, last I heard is unlimited food. So please come. Uh, Christmas is good for unlimited food. And then we also are going to have caroling at Tukan. Tukan is a dormitory, a migrant dormitory we're reaching out to. That's on the 23rd, 23rd December. Rehearsal time, I think it's going to be on the day itself. So don't worry because Christmas is a very busy season. But if you can spare a few hours before that and you think you know joy to the world, or you think you know one other Christmas carol, then yes, please join us. Time is going to be 7 to 7.45. There's going to be registration. Tiny URL is here, and they are bobbing and jumping up and down because I'm supposed to remember to pass the time over to Anna. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna. In case you didn't know me. How do I... Okay, that's my error. I'm supposed to like remember that there are two, but because the people behind were jumping up and down, right? So I said, like, oh, oh, that's the cue. Before that, I was telling Heidi, if I forget to introduce Anna, just jump up and down. So they were jumping up and down. You know Pavlov's theory of the dog? Association, right? So I said, like, jump up and down, announce Anna. Okay, so anyway, second offering, 12th November. Please remember, I think that's in about one week's time. Uh, so Methodist Welfare Service, the chaplaincy, so they rely on donations from uh, all the Methodist churches. So, please jump again. Thank you, Anna. Hi, I'm back. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here as a representative of the youth ministry, and we have a very special announcement for you. Okay. Hello. Okay, yes, I'm here to talk about our upcoming youth camp, Culture Wars, which will be taking place from the 20th to 22nd of December. So yeah, does this poster look familiar to y'all? Yes, okay, I hope so. Okay, it's from the movie Captain America Culture, uh, Civil Wars. Um, yeah, but we changed it to Culture Wars. And we have um, two teams in the very intense face-off over here, which some of them may look familiar to you. Okay. And any Star Wars fans here? Yes, thank you, Pastor Jason. I was looking at him so he can raise his head. Okay, we have our very own version of, um, well, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, um, Chewbacca. Yes, okay. Um, oops. Yeah, so why the fun and cool posters? This year's camp is a little bit different because we're going to focus on a topic that's extremely relevant to the youths of this day and age, which is popular culture. So as youths, we are the social media and tech-savvy Gen Zs, right? And we are one of the biggest consumers of media. Um, and as Christians, we should also think about how we can be discerning in the media that we consume, which is exactly what we're going to focus on in this year's youth camp. Yeah, we also learn about things like common grace, and how God works in the broader reaches of cultural interaction um, to bestow certain blessings on all people. And because of this, um, we can also come and appreciate certain things within popular culture as well. Yep. So there will also be lots of games. Um, there will be a Christmas party. 
yeah, I think this is the youth's first time hearing about the Christmas party. And bonding time, yeah, I know it sounds super exciting. So if you're a parent with a kid in youth ministry, do encourage them to sign up for the camp. And if your kid is a youth but not in youth ministry, um, joining camp would be a great entry point to um, come know us, um, interact with other youths, get to know the youths better. And if you're not a parent, then I'm so sorry. But <laughs> we kind of have an age limit. Um, with our oldest camper being 36 years old this year, so no prizes for guessing who. But um, yeah, you can still join us in keeping our camp in prayer. So you can pray for God to reveal himself to the youths. Um, and speak to them personally through the camp, and that this camp will help them grow in their spiritual journey. Okay, that's all. Thank you for listening and passing the time to Pastor Jason for offering. Eh? <laughs> they just want to praise God for the youth ministry. Actually, there are a lot of things happening there, and we have asked uh, them to actually share with you, especially for the parents the adults among us, even though you're not parents, but it's good to know what is happening at other ministries so that you don't have an excuse. Hey, what's happening? I don't know, I don't know, but now you know. Okay, and please also, if you're not able to participate or whatsoever, because if you notice, because of someone, the age limit will always go up every year. Right? 36, 37, right? Things like that. Okay, but you can always pray for the youth camp. And there are ways to contribute as well because they need supper. That one we can talk about later on. Okay? But for now, since we are talking about food, we talk about God's provisions and we want to continue to worship Him with His tithes and our offerings. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, you say that, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that by His poverty you might become rich. Indeed, Lord, we are so well off uh, whether it's material stuff, whether it's not especially, we are so well off, we are so rich in you because of what you have done on the cross. And so Lord, even as we give this morning, help us to always remember that we are so dependent upon your grace. We are so dependent upon your provisions and your watching over us each and every way, each and every day. So God, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can now come forward or you can use the QR code to give unto the Lord. invite you to stand as we give glory to God by praising Him with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures. Please take your seats. You want to welcome back Tikkun for bringing us the word. Let us uh, encourage him. Welcome him. Good morning and thank you, Pastor Jason. Uh, I've not been to a youth camp for the longest time. Somehow it's not been very inclusive these days for people like me. So I was trying to find a way to slip myself into the culture walls. 
And perhaps I could call myself senior youth. <laughs> right, not long ago, uh, our Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Loong, coined the phrase, uh, young seniors, right? Yeah, so I took some inspiration from there. Yeah, I hope you will welcome me, Anna. You are the younger youth, all right? And the senior youth among us uh, could turn up as well. <laughs> so this morning, we will uh, look at Job chapters 25 and 26. And I must say that as I prepared for this message, I had to uh, re-read the book of Job. And it was painful. Yeah, I'm sure it was more painful for the man who was suffering than for myself as I was reading it. And uh, more painful when you have friends, you know, like Bidet, and uh, who needs enemies, right? So, this morning, we will look at uh, what Bildad is saying in uh, Job chapter 25. Uh, he had actually run out of arguments. He was trying to argue that it can't be that Job was righteous for the circumstances that he was put through. And I think any mortal being who had gone through what Job went through would have given up a lot of stuff, given up hope, given up life. It will have been easier for him to die than to continue in suffering, isn't it? For those of us who are familiar with the book of Job, and even for some of us, turn our backs to God for what he had done to us. If we were suffering in the same measure as Job. I mean, look, Job lost his family, his assets, if you like his home, and he himself was covered with sores and boils and scabs, as we will read in due course. So this was a man who, despite what he went through, showed himself to be righteous before God. Let's read uh, together um, the two chapters. The first chapter here in Job 25, only six verses, and later on, 14 verses, all right? So let's do this together. Then Bildad the Shihuai uh, replied, Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? On whom does his light not rise? How then can a mortal be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less a mortal who is but a maggot, a human being who is only a worm? That's not very complimentary, all right? Then Job replied, How you have helped the powerless! How you have saved the arm that is feeble! What advice you have offered! to one without wisdom, and what great insight you have displayed. Who has helped you utter these words, and whose spirit spoke from your mouth? The dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. The realm of the dead is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space, he suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heavens quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea, by his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? Let's begin with Bildad. In chapter 25, 
Bildad made some motherhood statements about God. And he spoke for the third time and for the last time. He still couldn't accept Job's declaration of himself as righteous. And furthermore, what I like about the Nelson Study Bible notes on verses 5 and 6 is this. Bildad's view of God of God's dominion and majesty in the heavens causes him to devalue mortal man as a maggot. So, um, you know, popularly, maggot theology was actually attributed to Bildad. He responds insensitively to Job by suggesting that Job does not need to wait until he dies to be grouped with the maggots. This was very caustic sarcasm because Job was in fact covered with worms. If you were to read Job chapter 7, verse 5, Job himself said, My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. So while Bildad is right in making the point that human beings of themselves are corrupt and impure, are morally unworthy to have anything to do with God, he was wrong in making it seem that humankind is essentially worthless in God's eyes. Because God will later show just how much he values humankind through Jesus Christ actually becoming a human being and suffering for them and that to rescue even the worst of sinners. Let's not forget for a moment that you and I have been created in the image of God. Uh, no worm is created in that same image. So Bildad's brief speech here was the last we hear from Job's three friends in the book. In essence, Bildad spoke of the might of God and the utter depravity of men. Now, on the face of it, this is not wholly wrong, of course. God is indeed mighty. His armies are indeed great. And man is indeed impure and mired in sin. And the look, I mean, God looked at the human race and he discovered all of us. And even at the time when he looked down in Genesis, that they were desperately wicked. So there was nothing wrong in particular with what Bildad is saying at the outset. But as you read on, you will sense this unhealthy motivation behind Bildad's words. One senses, first of all, that Bildad is trying simply to win an argument here. So my friends, theology that is not done in the pursuit of truth and for the furtherance of God's glory on earth becomes a dishonorable subject. One should not slap bumper sticker theology on vain efforts to bolster one, one's own ego. So what is bumper sticker theology? Have you seen uh, bumper stickers behind the cars? Jesus is the answer. But what is the question? Yeah, so sometimes nah, all these quick fixes or maxims actually are just motherhood statements about God. And it can be applied rather insensitively. What is more, Bill that seems to be attempting to shut Job up by pointing to the distance between a holy God and sinful men. Again, God is holy and man is sinful. Yet it does appear that Bildad is appealing to these truths in an effort to tell Job to shut up. And definitely he's not applying it to himself. He should look at himself and perhaps keep quiet if he has nothing good to say. So, my friends, this 
is the use of theology as a weapon. Here, Bildad's declaration of God's might, God's omnipotence, was not a proclamation. It was meant to put Job at his place. So that said, there are some problems with Bildad's statement. If you look at verse 6, how much less a mortal, he says, who is a maggot and a human being who is a worm. Now this view sounds more Darwinian than biblical, isn't it? It is almost to the extent of blaspheming by speaking against men as a unique creation bearing the image of God. Man is sinful man, but he is man. There is a point past which the doctrine of human depravity is dehumanizing. Man should not be deified, but he must be allowed to be human. Now, in all fairness, uh, there is a sense in which it is also right to call man a worm. Uh, but you must properly understand. Uh. So John Piper, for example, uh, the preaching pastor, uh, for instance, has spoken with some helpful words to this question, is man a worm? Uh, when he considered the great missionary William Carey's tombstones inscription, uh, this was an inscription that William Carey wrote himself. And, and, and it went like this, a wretched, poor, and helpless worm. On thy kind arms I fall. So here is what Piper wrote. I tweeted this morning that I would like to be such a worm. I said, William Carey died today. And he was talking about... Uh, the day when he tweeted, in 1834, and his epitaph, his tombstone, were these words, a wretched, poor, and helpless worm, on thy kind arms I fall. Oh, to be such a worm. Now, not everyone feels proud of being called a worm, eh? let alone aspire to be one, right? Can you imagine, uh, you know, if you are asked an interview, what is your ambition in your walk with God? To be the perfect worm. <laughs> I don't know how that looks on your spiritual resume. But first of all, if you want to be the William Carey type of worm, then it's worth being one. That is, William Carey was an indomitable servant of Jesus who in spite of innumerable failures persevered productively to the end by grace alone, through faith alone. So what was William Carey's secret? How could he persevere for 40 years over all obstacles as a homely man suffering from recurrent fever limping for years from an injury, and yet putting the entire Bible into six languages and parts of it into 29 other languages. What was the secret of this man's dedication to the kingdom? Well, it was the biblical combination of being poor in spirit and being strong in faith. The secret of his life was that as a wretched, poor helpless worm, he fell daily and finally into the arms of Jesus. When he did, he expected great things from God. And therefore, in his life, he attempted great things for God. He was a wonderfully fruitful worm. And that's the kind of worm they would like to be, isn't it? But I know when I read scripture that William Carey was a saint because Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 declares that 
He was a new creation in Christ because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that. He was precious in the sight of the Lord. Psalm 116, verse 15. He was chosen a royal priest. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He was born of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. He was adopted child of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. He was forgiven. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. He was justified. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He was perfected. Hebrews 10, verse 14. William Carey was this kind of man. His wormness did not paralyze him. It empowered him because it drove him daily into the arms of Jesus. So I say again, if that's the kind of worm that we're talking about, oh, be such a worm. Li Peng and I often have conversations about uh, who will enjoy heaven first, and I reckon it will be me. That's the fate of men. <laughs> and I mean the gender. And so, um, you know, uh, I will probably be cremated. Um, and so, uh, on my niche, if we could, if we're still debating whether I should have one, uh, will be these words, uh, live to be forgotten. And so you don't have to visit me. <laughs> Very practical, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and it was not exactly original because I learned about this man of God who succeeded Hudson Taylor in the Chinese, China Inland Mission, who did so much for that predecessor organization of OMF. Uh, CIM, China Inland Mission, was the, was the predecessor organization of Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And when he succeeded uh, Hudson Taylor, this man served for 40 years. He was actually the last of the Cambridge Seven. And yet, most of us don't remember him. Dixon Edward Horst, D.E. Horst for short. And um, he did a lot for China, for the mission in China. He was instrumental to China Inland's mission development, not only in terms of organization and mission mobilization, but also indigenous principles which encourage the Chinese churches to self-grow and rely less on external missionaries. And he uh, was with CIM when they went through the Boxer Rebellion in China, a difficult period, and he was able to lead them with calmness and the power of gentleness, as one Christianity Today editor uh, put it. And one of the most important and striking characteristics of Host was his prayer life. And related to that, his true humility before God and in his ministry. Host never sought fame and reputation. And he believed whatever he did were to be subsumed under the desire to see Jesus get all the honor for everything. So, one of the current OMF missionaries wrote a monograph about D.E. Horst. And the title of that monograph was Live to be Forgotten because Horst had chosen to be hidden with Christ in God. So, my friends, Here we have, coming back to Job, right? someone who has been berated by one of his friends. Someone who didn't believe in him, and yet threw a ton of bumper sticker theology at the man. And this was his rebuttal in chapter 26. Job evaluated the counsel of Bidet, as worthless. While the New King James Version presents the opening verses of the chapter as questions, they could also be translated as sarcastic statements. 
as in the NIV and even the New Living Translation. The Good News Bible renders verses 1 to 4 this way, and I thought it's useful to read it for us so that you have a different, a more contemporary flavor because Job answered Bildad with sarcasm as well. And this is what uh, Good News Bible puts it. What a big help you are to me, poor, weak man that I am. You give such good advice and share your knowledge with a fool like me. Who do you think will hear all your words? Who inspired you to speak like this? <laughs> so this drips with sarcasm, right? What a great help you are, Bildad. How very useful your words and attitude and approach have been. Could we hear the tone of these words as spoken? You should really record and hear yourself play back. That's exactly what I would say. <laughs> All right. Bill Dad was being absolutely unhelpful. And in fact, his words were not in harmony with divine truth. That's why Job questioned him. Who inspired you to speak like that. It has been noted that Job, for the first time, uses a singular you repeatedly in these verses, as opposed to the plural you. In other words, he was homing in on Bildad. So there's something cutting about his comments here. He has focused in on Bildad specifically with razor sharp precision. Something in Bildad's little speech agitated Job greatly. And after rebuking Bildad, Job moves. There's just only four verses, right? But if you notice verse 5 to 14, Job moves to a proper consideration of the majesty of God. And I say proper because this should have been seen as a corrective to Bildad's declaration. Let me read verses 5 to 14 again for you. The dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. The realm of the dead is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading the clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of the heavens quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? So Job makes the most powerful statement here. And he does so in order to tell Bildad something important. God's glory is so great that Bildad cannot even begin to understand it. And in order to make the point, Job marshals a great deal of evidence. Interestingly, Old Testament scholars have pointed out that Job uses images from pagan mythology and Old Testament scripture in his speech. There is a powerful statement here about the sole supremacy of God. The Lord God stretches out the north over the empty space. In other words, he is supreme over all other gods. The Rahab in verses 12 to 13 is the embodiment of all evil forces and which creature appears not only in Isaiah 27 verse 1. Uh, it was the fleeing serpent that uh, was referred to in Isaiah chapter 27 and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. This was also identified with the dragon from Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. So by drawing 
these images from scripture, as well as from pagan mythology, Job was saying that the God of Israel is the one true God, and that he is Lord over all the nations. Furthermore, his name and attributes ought not to be employed to bolster a frustrated temper tantrum. This passage is really very intriguing. It is almost as if Job sets aside his central argument just as Bildad has in order to rebuild Bildad for his careless use of the name of God. Bildad's theology had become sloppy, emotive, and manipulative. Job, in rebuking Bildad, reminded him of whom he was speaking. So my friends, there is a lesson for us here. The Bible is not a collection of clobber verses to be strategically employed in your argument of the moment. It is not a holding tank for your own personal and pugilistic bumper stickers waiting for you to find just the right maxim to shut up your, op op your opponent. It is not used for this kind of warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, but sometimes we think that by winning the argument, it feels so good for us by demolishing someone else. But that's not what good theology is all about. We are speaking of the God of the universe. We do not honour him by using his name so carelessly, nor do we honour him by insulting his creation, by insulting humankind as a result. Remember of whom you speak. Remember who our great God is. Remember, tremble, and rejoice, for he has come to us in Christ Jesus. So my friends, what can we take away this morning, this afternoon now, as we look at these two chapters in the book of Job? Five lessons to take away. So the normal three points plus two. Bonus. Firstly, true can be false. What do I mean by that? If you take most of the statements of Job's friends separately, they all sound like good theology. But their application is shallow and insensitive. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Proverbs 26 verse 9 warns us, like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. So let's be very careful about how we use theology. We put a high premium on good theology. And obviously, we need to be uh, good Christians to understand Scripture for what it's worth. But let us be warned, it can be made false by the way it is applied. And it can even be destructive in the mouths of fools. So let's drink deep at the fountain of God's truth and let love stand as a Watchmen at the gate of our mouth. Yeah, so that when we speak God's truth, let us speak it holistically, fully, and for the sake of loving God and one another. So that's the first thing. True can become false if we do not apply it relevantly or uh, even uh, discreetly. Secondly, the evil can prosper. So Job is right. The wicked are spared in the day of calamity. That's what he said in chapter 21, verse 30. It seemed that those who are doing evil were getting away and they were going scot-free. But the just and blameless man is a laughing stock. That was what, again, he said in chapter 12, verse 4. Now, therefore, let us not judge one another before the time. We know there will be a day when, when Jesus is back and he will have all of us, the whole world, in fact, account for what 
they do. And those who suffer most may be the best, may be those who will be crowned uh, with the crown of life, those that will be given white clothes to wear, where we look at that symbolism in the book of Revelation, those who are righteous before God may be the ones who suffer the most. And those who prosper in their lifetime may be the worst. And eternal punishment is reserved for them. So let's not judge, let's not be envious about the wicked. Because the evil can prosper. But the day will come when we will be vindicated. Those who are righteous will be vindicated. Those who stand with the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted. The third lesson is that when we look at the chaos and madness in this world, when we look at the injustice that prevailed, God is in charge. He will always reign. God still reigns over all the affairs of humankind, from the greatest to the smallest. We may think that the whole world is thrown into confusion. We may be confounded by what's going on, but He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. And so, He is in, in charge. He is in control. God still reigns over all. The fourth takeaway this morning as we look at Job is wisdom concealed. There is wisdom behind the apparent arbitrariness of the world, but it is hidden from men. It is hidden from us. Let me read for us Job chapter 28, verses 12 to 13 and verse 23. Where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know the way to it, and it is not found in the land of the living. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. So my friends, God knows. There is something that is concealed for us because now we look through a glass darkly, as 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 tells us, we do not know fully as we are fully known, but faith always affirms that no matter how chaotic and absurd things may seem in our limited view, these are in fact the tactics of divine wisdom. So as we go through life, we don't know best. Lah. God works in mysterious ways. Right? And sometimes we wish He gives us a memo. We may not have very explicit revelation about what we are going through. We may not be able to tell what's going to be the end of it all. In fact, we may lack confidence when we see things happen of what it will eventually turn out. But God knows. Wisdom is at the moment concealed from us. But we know and we trust in the one who knows. And because we trust in the one who knows, we can hold his hand and walk out confidently even when the road seems dark. Because he is our light, isn't it? He shines the way. He will carry us through. And finally, hold fast to God. Yeah, somehow the D was omitted. I guess uh, you, you run spell check, you won't, catch, you won't catch it because go and God uh, correct spelling. But yes, on the go, we need to hold fast to God. Right. So whatever we do, we need to hold fast to God. This is not the time for us to turn our backs to God when things are not going our way. Because we don't know best. He does. And He is a good, good Father. 
And because he is a good, good father, if he clothes the lilies of the field, he feeds the birds of the air, how much more will he not care for each one of us? And it is that same confidence, despite what was going on in Job's life, that Job exalted God in his right place. He is far greater than any one of us can imagine. And he will definitely sustain us. He will definitely see us through. He will be there for us because he will never leave us nor forsake us. This is the message I would like to leave with you as we look at uh, Job chapters 25 and 26 this morning. No matter what, Sometimes our friends may say they don't know best. God knows best. And we need to come back to God and hold fast to Him every moment. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You watch our coming in and our going out. The Lord no one can pluck us out of our Father's hands. That we rest safe and secure in your promises, in your presence, in your protection. So this morning, Lord, once again we come to you, admitting how weak we are, how unfaithful we have been, how distrusting we can become where we see the going doesn't get well. We pray that, Lord, you will come by each one of us and in your fatherly manner, whisper your assurance into our ears. Remind us of the scripture that we have learned. Bring us back to where Job was and how he saw you, your greatness, your mysteries, your omnipotence. And yet, God, you are with him, even through his moments of despair. He held fast to you. And so this morning, Lord, we pray in the same way, we will hold fast to you. Help us not to be discouraged by what others are saying about you, about our relationship with you. Help us to know we can be sure and steadfast in your love, in your promises, in your protection. For we pray all these in Christ's most precious name. Amen. i
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and always. Amen. Please take your seats. God bless you.